Okay, guys, welcome back to the Short Story Long Podcast. I'm your host, Sam Derrickson, joined by my co-host, Andrew Dial. What's up, guys? And today is a special episode because we're also joined with Mr. Kyle Willenberg. Say hello, Kyle. How's it going, everybody? Our first guest. So over the past couple weeks, been enjoying doing this podcast and had some good feedback and spent a little bit of money on some extra stuff to have a guest on. And Kyle is the honorary first guest. So tell us a little bit about yourself, Kyle. Met these clowns through the car industry, I guess you could say. Um, I'm 29 years old, live in the big uh, town of Tatopolis, a small business owner, and uh, yeah. What business do you own, Kyle? Willenberg's Reconditioning. And what does Willenberg's Reconditioning do? Um, We specialize in ceramic coating, um, paint touch-up, bumper repair, rock chip repair, um, spray and bed liners, anything automotive related, uh, got a scratch on your car, we can buff it out, fix it, make it look as good as new. So Kyle has the body shop equivalent of a snap-on route. Uh, he goes around dealership to dealership. Just give us a 30-second recap of what that is. Walk the car lots, uh, check over the cars, make sure, you know, any any rock chip flaw, something that a customer would not necessarily want to you know, a red flag on buying a car. I don't want that car because the rims are scratched or, the, you know, it's got a ding in the bumper. I repair stuff like that and make it good as new and send it back out on the lot. All right. Well, I know Kyle, <clears throat> he's made a lot of my junk look new again. That's for sure. I think he's detailed a bunch of my vehicles, quite a few. Yeah. Um, so we don't have any emails this week, unfortunately. So right. you guys need to, uh, step up your game there and send yeah, us some three emails. Three people that listened last <laughs> week didn't yeah. have anything to ask. So, I mean, even if you don't have anything to ask, just email me and say your podcast sucks. That way I at least have some kind of feedback. Yeah, make sure the email's working. Yeah, make sure. Yeah. I mean, right now I just got Google as my only friend <laughs> sending me updates on stuff. Uh, so then the next segment after that be what's new. So what's new with you, Dozer? Well, uh, what's new with me, I guess, in the car world, we went the Altamont Swap Meet. Uh, what is it? The Rat Pack Car Club or uh, something like that? In something Yoga. like that. They every year have a swap meet in the spring, and it was like tradition to go. Well, now they do it in the fall. I had forgotten all about it. Well, it's two, it's two a year now. It's spring and fall. Right, but it was always spring before. I don't think yep. it was ever fall. And Sam's like, are we doing that this weekend? Like, I really don't want to go. I don't have time. I'm busy uh, doing the metal thing on weekends. Uh, Decided to go. I'm glad I did. I found a set of 71 Mustang disc brake spindles to make my Falcon 5 lug. And I think that's all I got. Did I get anything else? I don't think I did. I don't think so. Oh, well, I went crazy at the... uh, So, yeah, there's... I don't even know what booth you would call that, but... Well, they're at... I go to the swap meet in Indianapolis for the Indy cylinder head swap meet. And there's always one there and it's, I call it the, the mobile Harbor freight, I guess. I don't know really what they're called, but it's, it's a guy with just all the consumable stuff that you don't really think about needing for a car project. But I mean, he's got the cookie discs and, you know, wiring loom and yeah, I bought wire, wire, wire and loom. I bought, uh, relays with pigtails. I think at Indy, I fuse bought holders with pigtails. A uh, the the little carburetor block off plate that you lift an engine oh, from. Gosh, yeah, and I mean it's just a bunch of knickknack stuff, but it's really reasonably priced, and they're typically at a lot of swap meets, and so Dozer kind of went hog wild there, and just... yeah, I blacked out and <clears throat> come out the other side with eighty three dollars worth of stuff, one dollar at a time. Then I went home, and since I had five lug front end parts for my Falcon, which is four lug now for any of the Ford guys out there that know six cylinder cars like that, I needed a five lug rear end. So my neighbor <clears throat> is an old school hot rodder, and he's always like, Hey, if you ever need a nine inch, let me know. He's got three leaning up in the corner of his garage. 
So I go down there, no measurements or anything. I figure I'm gonna have to narrow this. My father-in-law has a narrowing jig for a nine inch. So I'll just go pick one. I went down there, had three different lengths. So I picked the shortest one in hopes to Jesus it would fit in my car. And then he goes, well, while you're here, come here and look at this. I need to, I need to get rid of this too. So I walked over the other side of his shop and I'd been in his shop probably 30 times. I'd never seen this. It was a huge off-road bumper with a worn 8274 on it. Which, for those who don't know, is a classic uh, starter motor-driven winch uh, for recovery purposes. So I made a deal, very fair deal, uh, for both sides, I feel like, on the rear end and, and winch. And brought that home and started looking into it. And it's like, I mean, there's like subcultures of everything and like there's a whole subculture of people that redo those winches and soup them up and add aftermarket parts to them and you can get like three four thousand dollars wrapped up in this winch you know i mean it'd be it'd be bad when when you got done but and it's just like why am i like that you know it's get this reasonably priced winch and i'm gonna dump a bunch of money into it you know people do like wireless remote and all that stuff so uh, that's just another project next to the jet skis and the tractors, and uh, it's gonna refurb a winch, I guess, restore a winch. Because I'm super excited because we can powder coat, so I'm gonna clean up all the pieces, powder coat it. But that uh, that's my car excitement. Which for what's what you, new. you didn't mention was that your lucky guess ended up having. Oh the... yes, I did not mention that. Yeah, I got home and the nine-inch rear end I picked out of his garage is the same width axle that in, in two areas both wheel mount to wheel mount wheel, yeah well, flange to flange flange to flange and the purchase so from what i can measure it's out of a 65 mustang which i think bring pretty big money so i do not even have to cut this apart all i need to do is buy some axle shafts and i'm sure my father-in-law has a nine inch center section somewhere and i'm gonna be in business hashtag blessed yes <laughs> so, yes even a uh even a blind pig finds an acorn every now and again. That's right, baby. What's up with you, Sam? So this weekend, um, I think I feel like I got a lot done. Um, I first and foremost was volunteered after the swap meet. I picked up next to nothing. I think I got something for one of my customers was looking for some stuff. And then after the swap meet, I went to my girlfriend's dad's and we got to drive a bunch of his cars over to St. Elmo to his brother's storage and got those all put away for winter storage. And then I got to try my hand at bodywork. I guess I was informed yesterday that it isn't actually bodywork. It's replacing body parts, which parts changer. it's, it's, it's still <laughs> bodywork because I'll tell you this, I have a did, newfound did respect. Did you sweat when you did it? Oh, big time. Oh, it's body work then. <laughs> because I have a newfound respect for body people because I I couldn't feel my fingers the next day, number one. And it's just when you fix something mechanical on a car, like brakes, it doesn't matter what it looks like. As long as it's back together correctly and it works, you're fine. On On replacing body panels... It's not that way. And Kyle is a good guest to have on here for this because he knows firsthand that it's not just exactly easy. So we had a Volkswagen Jetta that was in a deer hit and true to fashion, I didn't want to pay exorbitant fees to have it repaired. So I bought all the junk parts off of eBay and the just dark corners of the internet where they sell car parts dirt cheap and Uh, Come to find out that there is a difference in uh, car part quality when it comes to body parts because some stuff doesn't line up, some holes aren't drilled correctly. So that was a should have been about an hour and a half job, ended up taking about four hours. Um, And then Sunday, uh, I tore into a 5.7 Hemi that I purchased for one of my car projects. And come to find a lot of interesting stuff on it. So it was supposed to be just a ready to run engine and got to tearing it down just to, I want to make sure it was exactly what I was thinking it was going to be. And, uh, there was a little bit of moisture in the oil pan. So I thought, well, I better yank this off and check it. There ended up not being any gasket between the block and the oil pan. And, uh, 
no oil pickup tube. Mm, so gotta have that. That's that's slightly important. So kind of glad I didn't just slap it in the Jeep and fire it up. I know I would have. Because it I probably uh, would, have done the same. would have. <laughs> so what kind of idiot leaves the oil pickup off? Well, what the, made you look, what made you pull that apart? I would have never do this engine. You could eat off. I was gonna of. say by the looks of the engine, then I would have stabbed it in and went. So the story that I was told was it's out of a charger. And the guy had something happened to his car that he needed a motor for it. And he was building it with a 6.1 Hemi cam and lifters, which is a pretty substantial performance game for a pretty reasonable price. Um, but the, what made me interested in it is because the problem with the engine in the Jeep now is that the multiple displacement lifter failed and ground the cam flat on the number five intake side and basically junk the motor. So if you get rid of that multiple displacement system, you don't have to worry anymore. And that's one th- side effect of the six one cam and lifters is there's no MDS. So I wanted to make sure that that was correct. And I did know for a fact that it had the wrong oil pan to go in the Jeep. Um, the part number for the VIN he gave me that it came out of and the Jeep crossed to the same long block part number, just different accessories, different oil pan, different intake. So I knew it had to come off anyway. And after seeing the water that come out of the oil pan, I decided, ah, I should probably see what kind of, you know, condition the rotating assemblies in. And, uh, that's when I pulled, pulled the oil pan off and was pleasantly surprised that, you know, there was no rust. It looked really good. There's still a film of oil on everything. And I'm just kind of brand new oil pump. Yeah. I'm, I'm shining my light. Like, ah, oh, can I see if there's new timing guides in here without ripping the timing cover off? Like, Oh, that oil pump's new. And then I just kind of hit me that there's no oil pickup, pickup coming out of the new oil pump. So are oh, you fine? You put like eight quarter oil in it. It'd have been fine. Yeah. Turns out. So uh, that kind of leads us into what this episode. We're not going to ask Kyle what's new or <laughs> first guest. Just blow right past him or well, anything you want to talk about? Anything, anything new, exciting? Getting ready to head out to London, Kentucky this weekend for a big Mopar race. So for uh, kind of context, <laughs> Kyle is the reason I'm such a Mopar guy, actually. So we could probably do a whole half an episode of just the, the day we picked up the dart. Well, all, I mean, just all kinds of stuff. We I mean, could pick a subject, but I've spent a lot of time with Kyle, and he's been a friend of mine for a long time, but him and his family are diehard Mopar people, and I was not a diehard Mopar guy, but had had a lot of them. And uh, once I started hanging out with him, back to a previous episode when we talked about how muscle cars, you know, you could enjoy them more and not tear them up as bad. Um, he was one of the influential factors of me getting, uh, the dart sport that I drive now. So anyway, go back to your London, Kentucky story. It's probably the last race of the year for us. Um, like I said, all Mopar race, it's a million hours away. It feels like it's in the sticks. Uh, when you get in the sweet town of London, um, it's kind of like Effingham, have a drag strip at the very bottom of the mountain no cell signal i mean pretty secluded the first time we went there as we're driving in the motorhome cody just kept yelling at me like we better be on the right road you know we better be on the right road it just kept getting narrower and narrower and tree lit (coughs) tree limbs were touching the side of his rv and he was freaking out and (laughs) we get to the very bottom of the hill and it's just like one big old open holler of a racetrack and the owner's house is like on top of the hill and the racetrack's on the bottom like everybody's dream setup so i've never been to that race but from your stories i think it's it sounds like it's like, pretty sweet it's awesome like i said it's usually the last race of the year it's colder you know cooler temperatures but it's awesome mopars everywhere guys from all over i think we met a couple guys from canada last year michigan i mean and it's just a little, I call it a ho-dunk track. It's a really nice track, but it's literally in the middle of nowhere. That's awesome. That's really cool. So that brings us into today's episode, which is car project tips. I feel like 
you know, we're not necessarily professionals. We're not Chip Foose or, or Boyd or anything like that when it comes to, <laughs> to car projects. We've but, had our fair but share. But we have learned some things, uh, usually the hard way, over the last couple of years. And uh, we'd figure we'd just share it. So this, this episode today is going to be Car Project Tips by people who don't finish car projects. So anyway, uh, the first one I would say that I thought of was start with the very, like save up and don't, you know, have rose colored glasses. Start with the nicest car you can start with. So I, I, I'm a big believer in buying a half finished project. Mm-hmm. Um, because there's a mutual friend of ours named Nathan Holt, who is the absolute master of buying off-road vehicles that have been partially built or even all the way built and, uh, basically getting them for next to nothing versus what the guy had in it and just enjoying the hell out of it. Um, so case in point, um, Dozer bought is a really fun story, but we'll save the story. A 1969 Dodge Dart Swinger. Yes. And it was just pulled out of a fence row. There was a really cool story behind the car. And uh, were you going to make a drag car? What were you going to do? I was going to do a drag week car. I even somehow ended up with a uh overdrive a gear vendors overdrive i do remember that, that. <laughs> but uh no i traded the car for that but anyway i wanted to do a drag week thing and sam was a mopar guy and kyle was a mopar guy and who doesn't like a dodge dart sport and we're gonna go off the rails very quickly on this but uh this isn't even the car i had in mind to be honest it wasn't too bad it wasn't too too rusty glass was all good that was probably a good one uh, the, what made me think of, of this was that when I sold that, I bought a 67 Mustang that was gutted. I mean, there wasn't a thing left. I, I don't even think the steering column was left in. It was a shell. Was that the orange one? It was the orange one. Okay. Oh yeah. And that had rust. A one painted on yes. the door. Yes. <laughs> well, we did that. Uh, it had rust and, and it was just. When you buy a car that someone else has taken apart already, like there's no getting it back together when you've never been into one. I mean, it's obviously possible, but you know, it needed, it just needed way more work. And I, I mean, I gave like $2,500 for it. I could have probably spent another $2,000 and bought one that was running and driving at that time. So I, again, the whole rose colored glasses thing in the previous episode, we talked about, projects that you know or, or vehicles or whatever that we have and i you know two years ago i thought my ideal project would have been that 70b body that was basically body work done but needed everything else and you know on the back side of this i bought my 69 gtx that was basically ready to go i mean just running and driving yeah it was a heck of a lot more money but I didn't have 10 years invested in finishing one. You lose interest over time. If you buy a project not finished and you work on it here and there, you try to save money up, and then next thing you know, it's dead to you in the corner. Well, you get tired of that project taking all your extra money too, so you're like, screw this thing, you know what I mean? Like, I'm going to do something else. And and I think that's something else I was going to get into later, but I think – that's makes it hard to keep interested in a project because uh, you're always wanting to do something else, get something else that's a little closer to be done. You know, all your buddies are driving their cars. You know, let's let's get rid of this, get something else that's new. But that's that's another bullet point. But my point is, I think Kyle's dad on his Challenger seventy Challenger. He said if he had to do it again, he'd have went to the bank and got the money and just made the payments. Yep. Because he, he bought that car, or your stepmom bought the car, or stepmom whatever. Stepmom bought it. It was... A race car. They were, yeah, 90%, like, it was chopped up, had a cage in it, needed paint and wiring, and you probably could take it racing. And and how long ago did he buy the car as a race car? That was it a 10-year took, project. It took him 11 years to do the car. I think it sat for two, 
two or three years as they accumulated parts. Um, so yeah, I bet it's you know, thirteen to fifteen year project. I mean, it turned out absolutely gorgeous. Beautiful. I can I can't say anything against the man for for doing it the way he did it. But he said something to me that I mean, I've I've, I've taken it with me. He told me that you know, fifteen years ago. That I mean, it, uh, what what it's worth now probably sixty seventy thousand dollars somewhere in there, and he said, you know, when I bought this car, I think he what did he say? He paid like fifteen hundred bucks, two grand for I think it. They paid twenty five hundred bucks for so, it. So yeah, didn't pay nothing for it. But he said, when I bought this car as a race car, I could have bought it done for twenty thousand yep. dollars, and I would have had that loan paid off ten years ago, and I'd have been enjoying the car for the last fifteen. Yep. And, uh, so when I eventually had the opportunity to buy the GTX and get the bank loan, that's all that was going through my head was Dean in the background going, just buy the damn car and make the payments. Enjoy it. So, yeah. And, and I'm, I'm opposite. I didn't buy the car. I'm trying to build my Falcon, but I enjoy working on it. But I started with a completely rust free mint car. You have a very good start i mean it's you know it's not rusty i don't have to cut a frame rail out of it and you know i've had some mustangs like oh this thing needs frame rails you know torque boxes i would (laughs) yeah i'd have been better off saving another thousand dollars and buying a car that was rust free so which on the flip side of this i actually had the same discussion didn't know we were doing this episode uh this weekend with my girlfriend's dad and her mom and talking about my gtx well her mom has the 68 charger that her mom and dad built ground up. I mean, it was, I mean, it was a pile of rust and being a body guy, he got it looking just Barrett Jackson flawless. I mean, it's a beautiful car and they, they had made the commitment to themselves years ago. They had three young girls at home and that they decided they would not go into debt for anything car related you know they weren't you know, they were going to go to car debt for a pickup truck or a muscle car or anything only stuff that would be better for the family not for themselves personally and so they had the opportunity to piece this stuff together buy parts here and there and it did take them a long time and then on the back side of it they get a lot of pride out of the fact that they both built it i mean 100 percent, every nut and bolt the two of them had their hands on and they got some help along the way for, with some friends, you know, coming over and help Santa in it or whatever, but they take a huge amount of pride in the fact they did it themselves. So that's kind of the, the, the give and take on buying a project partially finished or mostly finished is that you lose out on that, I guess, sense of accomplishment at some point. But I mean, even, you know, myself buying a completely done car, it's sitting in my garage with the engine out of it. So, I mean, they're never, ever done, even if they're a hundred percent. I mean, your dad's challenger is quote unquote done, but he was working on it the other day, doing something to it because he wants to pull the cam that's in it out because it's too much for a street car and lame, which (laughs) exactly, which in his undefense, uh, I think the thing's got four mufflers and two resonators on it. It sounds terrible. It sounds like a tractor. Yeah. Yeah. So, which it's got a really hot 383 in it and you can't even hear it run. So it's, kind of a shame no it does not sound like a muscle car unfortunately that's when we <clears throat> when we tried to get him to do the burnout at gegner brothers he that's when he goes not his, gonna happen his famous line ain't gonna happen <laughs> yes. uh, although we did a burnout today in my driveway when cohen asked him to do a burnout in this teal truck the old blue truck well that doesn't count so it's, it's funny that ain't gonna happen it uh when i try to uh when i try to schmooze my wife into uh you know, uh, dancing and she'll even pull out the old Dean Wilmerk, not going to happen <laughs> in that voice even. So he's anyway, Damn. so that, uh, Damn. so I'm going to skip ahead in my list here. Cause I'm the only one who's obviously prepared for this podcast tonight. Um, <laughs> definitely was not. I, I had a reputation and a bad habit of, um, man, maybe it's the millennial in me of buying a or selling a project and well, I'll sell this and buy one that's more done so I can hang out with my buddies, you know. And I would always buy one, dump a bunch of money into it, lose interest, sell it, and be like, well, I'm going to buy, you know, buy one that's more done. And it, like, never happened that way. And 
we were drag racing up at Coles County with my father-in-law's Nova. And I looked around and I was like, all these guys are old. And like, you get to talk to them. Like I've had this car since high school. I've had this car since, you know, college. I had this car since before I was married. I was like, all these guys have had these cars 20, 30, 40 years. And I don't keep a car for six, eight months. Projects take time. Yeah. So I like realized at that point, like I'm already past the point where I can, well, I've had this car since before I was married. Like I done sold all that stuff. So I, I kind of realized, and I, I was real bad about selling one project to get into something else. I'd like, I sold my, one of my 65 Mustangs to get into night hunting coyotes and then so you weren't really consistent in hobbies. Sold my, sold saying. my, yeah, I, I would sell out of one hobby to get the next hobby. And then I just realized one day, like, I like all this. I'm going to want to do all of it. I just need to hold on to it. And I, I don't know where I heard it, but you know, they talk about, you know, in business books and stuff, it's, it's all about constant pressure over time. And, you know, not to get all, all cheesy, but Tony Robbins says, uh, someone will un overestimate what they can do in a day and underestimate what they can do in a year. Sure. So I just, it hit me at one time. Like I just, you need to hold on to something, even if you park it and, and don't get to it for a year, you know, as long as you don't sell it and lose your money. And then you, know, cause the prices are just going up. I couldn't replace any of the stuff I sold for what I sold it for. And so, and that's what you got going on right now. The, the Falcon you bought it, uh, almost a year ago. Almost a year ago. And old me would have had that thing sold, sold already heartbeat. big time. <laughs> oh, it had been so... For a massive loss. Yeah. And you worked on the Jeep for a little bit, and then you had the whole Peace Lily situation, Jedco situation. Yeah, KOH, helping Cody with KOH, took some time from that. And I just made the pact, like, when I bought that Falcon, and it, it stinks because you want to talk to your buddies about your car and like, well, you know, like, what's it matter? You're going to sell it in three I, months. I think anyway. we had a side bet on this. We that, did. That, I still do. <laughs> still do. And we've all lost actually. Right. So yeah. I guess the only winner here is Dozer cause he hasn't sold the car. Exactly. So my, my tip uh, in conclusion uh, with, after my ramble Tron is stick with something. Even if you lose interest for a little bit, it's probably come back around uh, you know, success is made by constant pressure over time, not necessarily a big, you know, get it done in a week like they do on TV. Just and and that's why I skipped ahead to this one. You know, you talk about Dean and and uh, your girlfriend's parents and stuff and all the guys at the drag strip like my father in law's Nova. I mean, these are 20, 30 year projects, 10 years. Uh, what's the average? I think Hot Rod Magazine had a stat out. I think I got an email one time. The average car project is 10 years. Yeah. So I got that email and I could maybe go buy something, but you know, I've got a shop full of tools and I really like making stuff and, and I enjoy working on stuff as much as. And this is the closest you've been on a project that I know of for a while. I mean, yeah, if you're I, gonna have a really sweet hot rod. Yeah, if, if I wasn't doing the turbo, I could probably have it driving in 20, 30 hours. That's awesome. But we're doing the turbo, so but we're doing the turbo because the turbo. a four door naturally aspirated 302 Ford Falcon's kind of lame <laughs> unless there's a turbo pipe sticking out of the hood. So, so yeah, so basically, like you said, in conclusion, to wrap up that portion of the of the tip would be buy as good of a project as you can afford and then go a little bit beyond that. So if you've got five grand to spend, be shopping in the $7,000 range and who Save knows up, hustle yeah. to make it happen. Yeah. Who, who knows? You might buy that guy, you know, guys asking seven grand for it. He might take five, you know, especially um, again, going back to car culture. If you spin a yarn with a guy and talk about, you know what your plans are with it. You might tug on his heartstrings and he might see a little bit of himself in you and Absolutely. say, you know what? I, I wouldn't sell it to that, you know, jackass neighbor of mine, but this kid, he's going places. He's he, going to try. He's going to treat this car like I would want it treated. And, and he might just help you out, you know? So, so buy as good as you can and then just stretch for just a little bit more. Cause I mean, if you look at Sam, you've had your dart for a long time, almost 10 years. Seven, eight years you know, now. Kyle's had his duster 
since, since I was high 14. school. Yeah, before high school, high school ish. Yeah. So, and that's something I I didn't make happen. I was like, oh no, you know, I'll, I'll sell this and and buy something else already done. You know, that was my big thing, and you know, it's an instant gratification thing. So, and then and then I'm a man of many 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 hobbies. So everything from rebuilding winches to drag racing to shooting guns and building guns interests me. And like I said, I'd always jump ship on one subject to do another. And I've just realized like, I just, instead of selling the car to work on my Jeep and do Jeep things, I just push it in the, pushed corner. It in the corner and I, I cannot wait to get back to it. I am so excited. So and that, that leads us into the next bullet point is do one thing a day. This is probably the most well-known pushed car project thing is do one thing a day. Uh, all the sloppy mechanics guys push it. Uh, you know, a lot of car guys talk about it. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong, but I feel like well, that's a big thing is do one thing a day. You're not wrong, but I think it's the maybe the most well-known, but the least practiced. Yes. Possibly. So I had, on my old Jeep, I had the front end tore out of it to do a truss on it. And, I mean, it just sat there. You know, it'd be, by the time we got done doing metal work or something, it'd be 8.30. And I don't want to start it tonight. You know, I don't want to start. And then, you know, it sat all winter in the garage on jack stands. And no progress was being made. And finally, I was like, I'm going to do one thing a day. And, man, the momentum from that is massive because... Once you start working on it at nine o'clock at night and then you just start, starts going and you look up, it's 11 o'clock and you've got a bunch of work done. And then at that point you're excited. So you see the it. progress. Let's do it right. again tomorrow night and the next night. And, that, and then even if you only have 10 minutes, like, well, let's, let's loosen this brake line and, and put this, you know, brake line drop bracket on, you know, you do that once. Well, I got the tools out. Let's do the other side. And you know, you did something for 15 minutes, but it needed done. Which so. I had that I had a pickup truck that needed a lifter, and it sat in my garage half tore apart for like four months, and I was getting pretty frustrated with myself for not making any progress on it. And like you said, you're like, oh, it's eight thirty. I'll just go take a shower and, and go to bed or whatever. Um, but I mean, there's a lot of stuff you can do between getting home from work and going to bed besides watching TV. And I think there was one night I went out there and I, you know, pulled the battery out and got started, you know, drained the antifreeze out of it. And I was like, well, this intake's, you know, it's only seven bolts on a side or whatever. I'll just yank this intake off. I yanked the intake off and I thought, well, let's see what's under the valve cover. So I saw what's under the valve cover and I thought, well, there's only 14 head bolts. So <laughs> in the matter of 45 minutes, I had the whole head yanked off the truck. Everything you've been waiting months for, you know, in one That's night. That's just how it goes. And then you get to the point like, what did I wait so long to do this for? Yes. It took like no time at all. Absolutely. Yeah. That's I mean, the same with house projects. Wasted 40, four months over a 45 minute job. House projects are the devil though. Uh, <laughs> I hate doing housework, but I, I get more reward from more gratification, more gratification yes. from getting something done in the house. But I remember I had a half wall at my old house and it needed trim done. And I put, I bet that thing was untrimmed for six months. And one day I just did it and I was done in 20 minutes. And I was just like, why did I, why did I drag that out so long? I've, I've built more house shit for the Willenbergs than I have for myself. So same was at my house. Now, every now you night. got a pretty sweet <laughs> podcast studio yes. now. So yeah, I mean, I, I got a half tour pulp tore apart wall i can see from here that probably would take me 45 minutes to finish tearing out but yeah that's besides the point yeah, we're doing yeah. podcast you got stuff now. to work on bud yeah, yeah cars are way cooler yeah you can uh you can sleep in a car but you, you cannot, cannot race a house that's Absolutely. right exactly so Absolutely. you can write that down <laughs> race car stuff <laughs> so All what's right. what's the next bullet point there oh the next bullet point is and this is uh, this is probably terrible to say after my my swap meet score would be uh, be careful on using used parts. So you know in today's day and age, it's cheaper to go buy a set of small block Chevy heads than to have an old set rebuilt. Really, uh, brakes. The caveat to this is, if you're a Ford guy or a Chevy guy, this applies to you. Us Mopar <laughs> people in the room. 
We don't really have that luxury. Oh, 440 source sells stuff pretty reasonable. And the set of Edelbrock aluminum heads isn't much more for a, for a Mopar than anything else. This is true. But, you know, I'm looking at those spindles I bought. And by the time you sandblast them and powder coat them, now I can do that in my shop. But n- most people can't, I would say. Well, it, it was funny because on the ride home, because you were pretty juiced up when you bought them. Like, oh, yeah, I got disc brakes. I mean, five lug really disc good brakes deal. <laughs> for a really, really good deal. <laughs> And so we're riding home and he's Googling uh, or rock auto in the parts and the, the hub and rotor assemblies was like $34 <laughs> on rock auto. Like, well, them are freaking junk. I can't sandblast them for that, you know? Yeah. And, uh, you know, brand new has brand new rotors for. Yeah. And the guy's like, you can rebuild these calipers. They're $30 on rock auto. Like I am not rebuilding these calipers. The, the cord am... charge was higher than the actual. Yes, caliper. exactly. So, but you did get spindles. You did get a deal. Um, the spindles were good, so you do have that going for you. And what what really made me think of this when I was doing my 65 Mustang, I found a an engine builder that built a 351 Cleveland for a customer, and then he never paid for it or picked it up or something, and the guy was parting it out. So I bought an Edelbrock high-flow water pump. I bought a Mallory Unilite distributor, an ignition box, all kind of stuff, a uh, high-flow fuel pump from this guy all used and i don't know how old it was or how used it was supposedly it was new but i I don't think it was or if it was it was sat for a long time because the ignition box didn't work which i think rick willenberg always says never buy a used ignition box for Uh, the record i have three used ignition boxes (laughs) for sale please email (laughs) knock on wood i uh I've had good success, but continue. But the water pump leaked. You know, the distributor had something wrong with it. Like, I ended up using none. By the time I got the car running, none of the used stuff I bought worked. And, you know, everybody tries to build their car on a shoestring budget and save money where they can. And and sometimes you're just better off just to spend the money. Bite the bullet. Yeah. I don't know, Kyle, you got any personal experience, any stories Uh. about that or all of them? All of them. I mean, you, used, you hit the nail on the head. Don't top, don't buy used carburetors. Um, used race car parts. Tell us oh about boy. some used race car part stories. I know you got them. I don't. I don't even know where to start. I could. I could start as far as like buying my car. Um, it was supposed to be a turnkey. Could race it. The guys raced it. They parked it for a few years. Um, car needed tires and seat belts. Uh, to the naked eye. We looked the car up and down, had it on jack stands, ran fine. Turns out we decided to pull the motor to put bearings in it. The crank was cracked. Um, brakes were pretty shoddy. Tires were junk, which we knew. And, you know, there's an issue with the rear end. Had a small, you know, 904 transmission in it, one to 727. It, it was like a snowball effect of a, a pure disaster. And uh, so your dad is, you know, famous for saying, do never buy a used carburetor. Yes. And uh, he, he's my carburetor guy. If yeah. I got a carburetor problem, I go to Dean Willenberg. We built my Dart. We couldn't quite get it running, you know, just, just couldn't get it. And, uh, I mean, it would run, it would drive, but it just wasn't right. It just wasn't quite right. We drove it to Montrose. Dean Willenberg came out with a Dr. Thunder in one hand, lit Winston, barefooted, lit, <laughs> lit Winston in the other hand, barefooted. You not know, even New Balances. Not, G- not, no. not even Je- New Balances. Jean shorts rolled up, two two turns on the bottom. <laughs> and uh, he, what are you boys doing today? And you know, we'd been on YouTube and Google trying to figure out. Oh, yeah, out. I bought a vacuum gauge even. I was oh, like, what yeah. are going to do with a vacuum gauge? What do you mean? And uh, so he's like, go get me a 916 syringe. So he... He loosens distributor, turns a little bit, and he's, you know, rev it up, and then he grabs a pocket screwdriver, and he tweaks some stuff on the carb, and he slams the hood, and he says, go drive that. And that was eight years ago. <laughs> we never, haven't never touched, touched it. Haven't yeah. touched it since. <laughs> but, uh, but, yeah, he'll say, do not buy a used carburetor. I mean, they're four or 500 bucks, unless you're getting some big stuff like Kyle yeah. is. But My, my um, carburetor story and my dad, I think 90% of the gray hairs came from me on my race car project uh decided one winter i wanted to <laughs> sam's over here smiling switch to alcohol because why not all the cool kids have alcohol carburetors they you know double triple enter their cars aren't hot 
alcohol's cheap, so I'm gonna jump on the bandwagon and uh, I think I paid like $800 for the carburetor and by the time I was finished trying to make alcohol work, I think I was three grand invested and went slower. Car went slower. It did run cooler. Um, I got really good at changing oil and oil filters. Uh, burnt through a shitload of alcohol. My favorite part of the story is every issue. The car had a flat tire. My dad, we call him Mean Dean. It's on alcohol. That's why the tire's flat. Yeah. Like, seat belts won't click. Like, nope, it's on alcohol. There, yeah. there. That's the problem. And then I was over at your dad's house one spring trying to get it fired up, and the alcohol drawed so much oh, yeah. moisture. We put two tanks of gas in it, still couldn't get the moisture out of the. It's like straight water. Like it just, it was nasty. And the lines were all night. Na- like, and your dad about had an aneurysm just. Just so upset about the alcohol in the car, and then finally went back to gas. Yeah, he was done at that point. Well, you had that dyno tuner. It made, like, big power made, on alcohol, didn't it? Made it made really like, good power for no more cubic like, inch than it was. It was, like, 800 horse or something, it? was wasn't 796 it? To, the, to the wheels. To the wheel. That's big power. Out of a 505 cubic inch little Indy motor. With a three-speed transmission. With a three-speed 727. Yeah, I thought when you... Sent those dyno results. I was like, this guy's, this yeah. is going to be moving. And it didn't. Well, it's 3,000, 3,200 pound car. Well, so is Jerry's Nova. Well, small box yeah. Chevy. Yeah. <laughs> but Chevy's, che- Chevy's aren't, it's, it, they have different rules for yeah, Chevy's. Yeah. Yeah. You buy all those parts off of eBay, apparently, and go fast. But, uh, on, so my used part story, I'm more guilty than anybody, I guess, because everything on my car is used. Used ignition box, still working. Um, used tack, still working. Uh, the head, the whole engine was used. Used heads. Um, I put it together just kind of like you said on a shoestring budget. Used cam, um, used carburetor, and uh, I mean it still runs rich, but it runs. And uh, I'm getting ready to put used turbos on it, so. <laughs> Hopefully that treats me just as well as everything well, else. I guess I mean if you listen to the Y yard, everybody's every car's on running yeah. used parts. So. Exactly. Every, everyone's running used parts. So um, the only thing I really bought new for that car, you know, parts wise, would have been I bought a whole front suspension and bushing and ball joint and everything kit, which money well spent. Um, brand new headers and a brand new shifter. Um, the transmission was built with used parts out of Dean's mom's house. Yeah, I was going to say, them come out of the milking parlor. And, uh, I mean, I, I bought some new parts recently to build the transmission the right way. Remember but... when we wrote our names on the transmission filter that in the core? Because we put a new transmission filter on it, and we wrote, like, Sam and Dozer and, and put it back in there. Like, ah, oh, someone will find that one day. <laughs> I wonder... I wonder if it's still there, if the transmission fluid's ate it off yet or not. I mean, tranny's been hot a lot. <laughs> not the one in your car, the the core you gave Dean, and he oh, put out at Grandma's. Oh shoot! No, I we'll, forgot. We'll find all about that one that. day, I'm sure. Yeah. So, any more bullet points on that list, there, bud? Uh, I've got one more more that's uh, right up your alley, and that is use the right tool for the job and or buy it. Some people say if you have to if you have to borrow it more than 3 times, you need to own it. And my big thing uh my biggest example of use the right tool for the job is the old Snap-on BJP1 ball joint press. Hands down my favorite tool that yes. we sell. So I was putting ball joints on my dad's truck, which was an 11 Ram 2500. And, you know, I don't need to buy a ball joint press. I'll go to O'Reilly's and rent one. So I went to O'Reilly's, rented it, and got maybe the top one out, I think. And then the bottom one, it just was not happening. I'm pretty sure that that port store press, like, bent way open, and it just wasn't going to happen. So uh, I called Sam. I was like, what am I going to do? Because he's kind of a tool guy. He's a Dodge truck guy. He's like, oh, you got to have the BJP one. No other ones will do a Dodge axle. I was like, well... You know, I I don't know. So he brought one over, and I mean, it buzzed it right out. All the adapters snap onto it, and and it 
it was just amazing. I was like, well, I can't afford this. He's like, sure you can, $10 a week and it's yours. So that's not the first tool I made payments on, but that's probably one of the more expensive ones. And that's when I was side hustling in my garage doing mechanic work after a day of selling advertising because apparently I was not good enough at selling advertising that I didn't have to have Make a second extra, job at yeah. home. But I think I did two or three other trucks. I did ball joints and it paid for that ball joint press. And I use that thing for everything. I pressed the suspension bushings out of my wife's van with it on the back trailing arms we used it to dimple dye Jason's top on his Jeep to fit the Zeus fasteners. I mean, I use that thing to change U joints. I mean, it it's... is it is definitely one of the best engineered tools that I sell on my truck, and it's one of my favorite stories when people are talking about maybe purchasing one. Is I kind of guilt trip a minute and I say, uh, "Well, I sold one of these to a freaking ballpoint pen salesman, and you do this shit for a living. What you know? What's wrong with you?" And, uh, it's, it's even in the marketing video that you can watch on YouTube about the parts store one or the OTC or whatever, that the, the C frame is made of a substandard quality material and it bends from its normal C shape and it spreads open and the angle actually wedges the ball joint into the axle and it just won't ever come out after that. So, um, it's, it's one of those things where in my profession, of selling tools, a big portion of the value that you get as a mechanic from the tool is the amount of either time, effort, or just headache that that tool saves you. So in the case of the ball joint press, I mean, there's a dozen other tools that'll get the job done, but the snap on one in particular gets it done in such a way that you are less stressed it gets it done quicker and more efficient. And if you're a flat rate mechanic, you physically reap the reward of a faster job completed, bill more hours, make more money. So in, in the car world, when it comes to projects, having the right tool makes a huge difference. And if for nothing else than just your specific application, just your sanity in general, so right and you're not tearing up something you know trying to drive a seal in with a socket instead of a seal driver you know it's try to do it with a socket you may mess the seal up and then you're like, i don't want to buy another seal so i'll leave it and you got a leaky pinion seal or something like that and the big one like say the right tool for the job can give you a better result Absolutely. but and not tear stuff up but also it can make it go a lot faster. I remember I had that 73 Corvette I got from Ryan and I was going to do all new front suspension uh, bushings. And like, I was trying to like press them out with sockets and bolts and my press. And you're like, here, you know, didn't, didn't I sell you an air hammer? I was like, yeah, I don't ever use it. Really don't know anything about air hammers. So you're like, walk over to my toolbox and get it and plug in. It's like, burr, and just air hammers the bushing out in like a second. And I was like, okay. And that air hammer might be my favorite tool. Really? It, I mean, I really like the ball joint press, but as far as saving me effort, the air hammer, I mean, driving bushings out, driving bolts out, it's, it's been amazing. And it, I could go on for days. Because you can get that into a place where you can't swing a hammer. Oh, absolutely. And you just get in there and and when i was buying and selling and porting out garden tractors garden tractors at least you know 70s and 80s john deere garden tractors are held together with roll pins and you sold me that roll pin attachment and it's just i mean you could beat until you were numb in the hands with a hammer and you just grab that air hammer and it just hammers it right out so i like what it's kind of cool you know you know call it life hack or whatever but i don't have the you know knowledge or ability to do a bunch of TikToks and stuff, but a guy, maybe not me, could do a really cool TikTok channel of I bet you didn't know your tool could do this. So a uh, you know, in terms of the air hammer, I sell an attachment for that that has either a three eighths or a half inch anvil lug to put a socket on. And then it's got a three quarter hex on it that you put a wrench on. 
And if you've ever used the impact socket driver, that's basically a, a punch that spins when you hit it with a hammer. Um, a lot of guys use it for taking the screws out of brake rotors or mm -hmm. whatever. The problem with that is you got to hold it with one hand and swing a hammer with the other. And it's kind of a cumbersome project and you're not in control of what it's doing when it spins. So firsthand experience, I've sold a bunch of them, but I was working on a Jeep JK that was rusty. I mean, it was a pile of rust. Rust free, actually, I was told. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I needed to get the tailgate off of it. And if you know anything about Jeeps, they're all held together with Torx bits. And Torx bits are awesome when they're brand new. Uh, but if they're sat for any length of time and have rust or they're stuck, Torx bits are just an absolute nightmare to deal with. And I broke two Torx bits and rounded out one of the screws and I was frustrated and I was about ready to hang it up and I was like I bet this tool would work so I put the air hammer attachment in the air hammer put the t40 torx bit on it put a wrench on it and about three or four taps with the air hammer and almost just the weight of my hand resting on the wrench spun the bolts out and I was like oh yeah this so I mean I would have rounded every bolt off on that thing had I not thought of using that tool and it's just like how many times do you see something and not have a solution and think oh well there's another way to do this and another tool could have done the job so having the right tool for the job does make a huge difference um what what in the race car world would you say would be something like a, a must-have tool for for race cars. It don't even have to be race car. Many. What about any body shop tools? Like you, I could not I, do my job without this. I mean, so, and, and like air compressor don't count. Yeah. So back to like you said, having the right tool. Um, rupees or rupees, everybody calls it different. Is like the number one brand in an orbital polisher. Um, they're very proud of them. So we're talking about buffing vehicles. But like a buffing, so, you know, you paint a car, you have to wet sand and buff it. I ceramic coat a car, you know, we do a three-step paint correction process, so you're running a buffer all day long, um, essentially. And in the old days, it was just a wool pad that wool spun pad a pad on a rotary, and you would swirl the crap out of everything. And, you know, your old, your old guys, your body shop guys, you know, still will tell me, your father-in-law, for instance. Like, I can get a better polish out of it. I, 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 I can get it better, you know, using my rotary like you can, but I fix your swirls every day <laughs> that you put in it from the rotary. i uh, burn. <laughs> literally burning in the paint. But uh, this polisher, you know, I would bought like the Amazon version. I, you know, shopped around, tried to buy a cheaper version of this rupees tool, I ended up biting the bullet, spent the money. Um, like I said, I think the one polisher was like $700. Woo! Night and day difference. Like, you can cut the swirls out in just like two passes. And what I mean passes, you know, left to right on like a fender and then go up and down on the fender. And, you know, no scratches, no swirls, no nothing. You're ready for polish. Um, I think... I like started ceramic coating two years ago and was using like it would take me 30 hours to paint correct. And now that I have the right tool, I can do it in 10, Right. you know, if, and then, and that's a really bad, you know, that's doing three or four passes each panel with each step of the paint correction. Um, but the rupees tool is night and day. We even, I bought just not too long ago, they make a, like a two inch polisher. And I always thought like I would never use one for like tight detail. Yeah, work like or whatever. it's three hundred and seventy-five dollars bare tool, not counting the battery. Like I think it's dumb. I don't need one. I'm not going to use one. I found one on the internet, bought it. I actually thought I got scammed out of the deal. Like bought it, bought it, PayPal the guy. It never showed up. Two weeks later, it showed up, and it's exactly what he said: brand new tool, never been used. Um, we use it all the time in between your emblems on your vehicles. You know, underneath the mirrors, the door handles, stuff like that. And that just that's that's a perfect example of nice tools are not expensive. They I mean, his tool if, if it cut his time 
down to one third, it, it pays for itself quick. Your cheap tool is what's costing you. Right. So that's the price versus cost comparison. Right. It's costing you money to have the inferior tool because you're losing time or whatever. And the price of the good tool may seem high, but the cost is actually low. So anyway, Kyle, enough about us and our crap. Um, you're our guest, so this is a automotive podcast. Um, obviously, we know that you have a race car. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your race car, and then tell us about some other fun cars that you have. I have a 71 Dodge Demon. Um, still have the title, factory dash, factory door panels, everything to make it i would call my dream like drag and drive car um it's 505 cubic inch andy cylinder head made a rotating assembly bought it at the indy swap meet uh it's on a big tire full cage runs like 615s religiously um not fast enough obviously but it's deadly consistent as a bracket car and uh yeah i've actually can say this year i've won won a decent amount of money racing it didn't cost me money to race this year fighting a cracked block issue right now but just trying to buy time uh for this winter i have also a 72 plymouth duster we started out as a 344 speed car. Uh, 21 year old me drank a few too many beers at the orchard one night and spun the cam bearings out of it. Um, thought I was on the rev box. Turns out I was floating valves. Uh, drove around for I think three years with no oil pressure. I mean, Dean was not going to take it apart until it broke. Um, it finally started knocking hard enough that we built, uh, didn't really build. We pulled the motor out of the dragster my brother, uh, had, and just kind of transferred the 496 from the dragster straight into the duster. Still need to put a pause in it. I think my dad's holding off on that project for a reason. So does it still have the seven and a quarter in it? It has an eight and a quarter. Eight and a quarter, yeah, yes. eight and a quarter, sorry. Eight and a quarter, eight and three quarter. No, eight and eight a quarter. Eight and a quarter. Small. It doesn't have a third member yeah. chunk he, like the eight and three quarter. He, okay. When we built a car, I was in high school, and my mentality was like burnouts and just abuse everything. Why not? So he, it was a, it was a one-legger and still is. Well, not anymore now that it's got power that it can actually – Get the spider gears get, get, moving. Get the spider gears moving, but uh, it was a one-wheel peel car, and like I said, I think he did that on purpose when we put it together. Was so I wasn't out just beating the dog crap out of it. Yeah, I remember me and you took it out that one night, and we went to my like where Midland Bank is. It may not have been yes. built yet, and you're like, if you back up first, it'll you got to you got to roll back like three yeah. foot, and then pop it in first gear and dump the clutch, and, and it would. Oh do it. man, we did a massive <laughs> burn. I was like, this is so cool. I gotta get me a muscle car. Yeah. The so old pistol grip shifter just sitting there shaking, shaking as you're the, just yeah. hammering the motor at about three psi oil pressure. Yeah. How many times have you bloodied your knuckles shifting into third gear, hitting the ashtray? A lot. <laughs> I always thought that was like a myth. My dad would always say, "Like we were street racing back in the day." And that's a boomer thing. It, yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. boomer. My cigarette was hanging in my mouth, and I I punched a dash, and you know the radio didn't work, and. I was like, yeah, that's not even a thing, but turn turns out that, that, that that's the real deal. So, do you have an axle built for it, or I do have a eight and three quarter built for it. Um, have need different wheels for it. Um, it's on like a fifteen inch wheel. Just I was balling on a budget when I built it. Who isn't? Yeah, still am. Yeah. A um, few things I'm gonna do this winter. Get it going get it in the right direction it took me like i said we started i think i had a motor built for the car i did i had a 383 built for the car for i think um two or three years and like i said dad's like we're not pulling it out until the rods fall out of the bottom of it and i would every time i drove that car my mission was to like blow it up just scatter it like this weekend's the weekend we're gonna do it and i would beat on it and 
it, that, it was like the little engine that could. So it, what do you think's tougher, a 318 or a 340? Because 318s are known three, for just well, being bulletproof. Them bullet derby bro. car guys run them 318s like they're, I don't know, that's a tough. It's like, like the Slant 6. I have a 67 Dodge Dart with the Slant 6. Same thing. I have a 360, 8 and 3 quarter sitting on the floor, uh, 727 for it, and my dad's like, well, whenever that time comes, we'll do it. And like, I've ran the car out of oil. I neutral drop it, like reverse neutral drop it to do burnouts. Or it, get James it, Davis to lift or, up on the back bumper. Yes. Get James Davis to lift up on the bumper to do burnouts. And the other day, like, it's been sitting for over eight months. Um, I poured a little bit of gas in the carburetor, pumped it like 25 times, <laughs> <laughs> and it fired right up. Uh, not 26, yeah, not 24. Yeah, like, pumped the crap out of it. My three-year-old's like, Dad, this is awesome. You know, the car don't have a top. This is awesome. And that, that car is pretty cool. Uh, the Slant 6, though, man, they're just, they are freaking everywhere. I know of two forklifts that have Slant 6s in them. I just seen oh, one today. Yeah, they put them in every, like, up into the 80s. Yeah. That's awesome. The leaning tower of power. That's right. Yes. I, when I built barns for Nieberge Lumber, uh, the, my foreman had an 80s Dodge truck with a five-speed or a four-speed or something. And I was like, what, what motor you got in that? He's like, slant six. He's like, they didn't put slant sixes in pickup <laughs> trucks. He's like, sure go over there, been... pop the hood. Like, there it is. Yeah. The, the, lady, the lady I bought my, my convertible from. She's a treat. She, she's a dandy. <laughs> but that was their thing. They were into weird old cars. But, like, half of the cars they had were all, there was all slant six. And they're reasonably rare, but not necessarily desirable they had the spirit of 76 dart sport which i would not mind owning that one day if they would sell it to me that is a, that's a pretty slick car they have a 74 dart a green one um slant six they had a pickup truck like you know dozer mentioned a truck but they have i think it's a 76 or 78 single cab short bed two-wheel drive with a three on the tree slant six nice my first ever muscle car that I traded my 94 Jeep Wrangler for come from Crazy Betty, uh, 72 Dodge Dart. Shout out to Betty if she's listening. <laughs> yeah, 72 Dodge Dart Swinger, uh, Slant 6, 3 on the tree. I delivered pizza for Pizza Man in that thing. I have and yet to drive a 3 on the tree. Neither have I. It is a life goal oh, of mine. It's awesome. So email us if you have one. I want to drive it. Yes. Um, so I guess... Some questions from a previous podcast. What is your, I guess we'll just do two of them. What's your dream car? If you could just make, just snap your fingers, it's in your driveway. And then what is a car that you personally know of that you just couldn't bear to not yeah. own? That you, well, just a, What's, car, what? a car you know personally that you love but don't own. Okay, yeah. I could go two with that one. Um, one of them. My dad goes way back to when my mom and dad got divorced. He had a, I think it was a 66 or 67 um, Hemi. It was a Belvedere and silver Hemi four-speed car, like flawless. Uh, going through a divorce, unloaded the car, talks about it all the time. I, you know, I would do anything to have it back. That That one car, you know, I would do anything. He always talks about it. A few years ago, we were a few years ago, probably eight years ago, we went to a Mopar event and the car was there and for sale for like an ungodly amount of money. And, you know, he's like, when I had it, I sold it for 15 grand and I think they wanted like close to a hundred thousand for it. Which your dad said, I don't think I'd, I never got another dime more than nope. that. That was like top that dollar. Was like he, he made out like a bandit at that he thought. time. Well, he thought, yeah. And, and, and that's funny too, cause I've got a customer that had a basket case, uh, Hemi Challenger, yep. uh, no Hemi Cuda. He had a convertible Hemi Cuda that he sold for $40,000 as a basket case. And it sold at Barrett Jackson a few years later for like 1.6 million yeah, or crazy. something. Um, and God damn it. I hear that story all the time. Oh yeah. my, my Hemi Cuda, my Hemi Cuda. So that's one of the reasons why I don't want to take the Hemi out of the GTX is because Everyone's got that story about the Hemi that, car they used to like have. That's like Hemi story. Like, yeah. It was that car 
Um, my the car that I know, and Sam and Dozer both know this car. Um, the day my dad graduated high school, he ordered a '76 Dodge Aspen. Uh, it was a 318 car, automatic, had black steel wheels or something. Three days after he bought it, he was had the cherry picker underneath my grandma's tree in the front yard and pulled the 318, out. 318 out, put a 440 with a four speed in it. Um, the car was brand new, brand new, like three weeks old. He did all this Why stuff. Why didn't he just buy one of the 440 in it? They didn't offer it. They did not offer okay. it. Okay. Yes. Um, he changed the wheels, um, sold it to one of his buddies. One of his buddies sold it back to one of my uncles. My uncle wrecked it. He sold it to a guy, um, got back in my other uncle's hands. My uncle sold it back to my dad. My dad sold it. The car went to, I think, Louisville and like got wrecked again and was parked forever. And my uncle Rick ended up with it. And I've offered him many a times more money than the car's worth to get it back. Not because like Dodge Aspens are not like a desirable car. Like it don't, it don't do nothing for me. It's cool. It's an old Mopar, but it's not like a 70 Roadrunner or a, you know, 69 Charger. But it's your dad's car. But it's my dad's, you know, he still has all the paperwork from the very first time he bought it. So what cracks me up about that story is I love your dad to death, but he is a boomer and he's a fuddy duddy. And I don't know what happened to him to turn him from the old school hot rodder into the guy who's got 45 mufflers on his car. The old man. But so when I first started hanging out with Kyle, he had a bunch of really, really awesome, nice, clean second gen Cummins trucks. And your dad would just light a cigarette and shake his head because you'd have a tuner on it. You put wheels and tires on it. You boys Exhaust. just you boys <laughs> just can't leave nothing alone. You just just drive that truck. It's just fine the way it is. And then it would always come back to coming from the guy who did a motor swap on a three week old brand new car. Like, <laughs> you have no room to talk, old man. He, he ordered it and knew like the day he ordered it, like. I'm, I'm going to have a big block in it. It's going to have 440, you know, four speed, changing the wheels, doing this, doing that. And like Sam said, it goes back to every single, every truck I've owned. Like I'm going to put wheels and tires on it, or I'm going to tune it, or I'm going to delete it, or I'm going to do this. Like, can't you just ever leave anything alone? Like, no, you have no room to talk. That's right. Yeah. that. I mean, I might be going that way too, though, because... I remember welding extra mufflers onto my V10 Super Duty. And when I got my K2500, it was straight piped, and I bought a factory muffler to put on it. I, I think and, at the same time, I bought a factory exhaust for a Grand Cherokee, at like right in the same time period. And we looked at each other like, how freaking old are we? We bought factory exhaust. exhaust. Like, who does that? Yeah. Who does that? <laughs> I'm the same now. I mean, you know, and like Nick and Tony were talking about that on their podcast, Straightforward Farming, about how, yeah, I, I love a straight pipe tractor and a straight pipe truck, but I don't want to be in one all day. Right. No, and I'm, I think that's like my hot rod will be loud, but my daily driver is going to have a factory muffler on it. Mine's going to have cutouts so I can make it both. There oh, okay. You go. Captain's choice. Fuji. So th- those are the cars you know of that you would love to have or whatever. What is like. Snap your fingers and it's yours. Just d- pick anything. Dozer did something lame as hell, like a diesel truck. No, I. D- <laughs> yes, you did. I said a you drag said week. A new- I said a drag week car or a brand new diesel pickup truck. Anyway, so it, the sky's limit. You I mean you could pick up? Yeah, what do you a, want? A Lambo? No, definitely not a not Lambo. Lambo. Okay. A, a Malibu uh, wakeboarding Ferrari? boat? No. No, Poor. I would. Like, this I would. Is like a car. You guys have me. Any car you want. <laughs> uh, a ski boat. <laughs> <laughs> Am I doing this right? You got <laughs> rim tire. We, 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 we've all uh, been turned on about this drag and drive thing um, a lot lately. It's been a, like a conversation between our friend group. Pretty hard for ten here. years. Yeah, it, for ten years, but a lot more now. Than Once it ever. a year. Yeah. Following the actual drag, drag week, week event. So I think if I had to pick, like, 
you know, a dream snap my fingers, I would do a, uh, probably like a seventies roadrunner, um, tube chassis, Hellcat motor engine as, you know, motors are electric quote unquote. Yeah. Engine. Yeah, engine. engine. My, my uncle Rick would have a fit if he heard me called a, a motor. Good thing he doesn't listen. Yeah. <laughs> Shout out to Rick. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, Tell you what I have done. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Probably something along the lines of that, like a resto mod. I mean, I love my demon, uh, maybe even a 69 Dodge Dart Hellcat swap, something streetable, but still like a 550 eighth mile car. Maybe I could drive and get ice cream with. Do you ever think about putting your demon back on the road? It's a like long term goal. Um, I don't think I'll ever, you know, go as crazy as like my dad did with her Challenger as far as making it like strictly a street car. But you know, technology's changing. Everything's changing. I foresee a new style Hemi in my near future in that car. Um, oh yeah, you're all juiced up yeah, about I'm that pretty, fuel injection. Pretty juiced up about the fuel injection. No more adjusting valves. Ma- making my dad's head spin on you know pulling the old laptop out and giving her a few more uh, degrees of timing and. You know, me and Jerry, my father-in-law, we talk once a month about putting an LS in his Nova and putting it back on the street. I mean yeah. it, and the <clears throat> the only reason it hasn't happened not already is because we went and started winning Street Fighter class at Coles County with it. But he was going to put it back on the street with a, you know, I, I want to do an LS with a 4L80E overdrive. He's like, oh, I can get me a 280, turbo, turbo, 283, 283 with a turbo 350 and put a 273 rear end gear in it. And it'd be sweet on the street. Like, what? No. No, no. not so much. No, not we're so going to put. Kyle Bement is my idol. Scram speed. You know, I think it's a Firebird or Camaro. It's a Trans it's Am. A tra- tra- yeah, Trans Am. Uh, Firebird. <laughs> sorry, same. They're all the same. Kinda. Kinda. Um, you are know, all Firebirds? Are all Trans Ams are Firebirds? But all Firebirds aren't Trans Ams. It's like a those. rectangle square situation. Yeah. I'm not a Chevy guy. We're good. Hey, maybe we'll get our first hate mail. There uh, we go. Pontiac. <laughs> but uh, he he's got a Trans Am. Big single charger, you know, full dash. The windows roll up. The air conditioner works. Cruise control works. Uh, I think his fastest pass at Drag Week was like mid sevens. Yeah, he in was the well. He was well like, into the sevens in the like quarter. One hundred seventy eight mile an hour. Um, and he had that car tore apart for a while. Yeah, two or, or three two, years. Two or three I think. years. He finished third fastest in his class overall. So, so with that that car. He used to come to Coles County, so he lives probably, yeah, like an Rantoul. hour. Rantoul. So 40 minutes from the local racetrack would show up with a, I call him a deer carrier, like a slide-in receiver mount with his uh, 10.5-inch slicks and two jugs of methanol, and he would jack the car up with his factory jack that the car came from, or came with, um, Put his drag radials or, you know, slicks on it, mop ass in the Super Pro class, and drive it home. Like, you would see him at the Burger King on the way home getting ice cream with his wife. And then the next year, my favorite rendition of this car, so the license plate says not dipped. Because it was back when Plasti Dip was a big thing, and it's a flat blue, and it's an actual paint Paint job. job. And so his license plate says not dipped, but he had it, the next year he had a trailer, and the wheels of the trailer were his front runners, his skinny fronts. Yep. And so he'd take the wheels off the trailer, put them on the front of the car, and then the trailer held his slicks. Right. And then he had his jack and his fuel so he, jugs. So he had his, for non-racing like racing people, he had a gripped front tire that he ran on the street on the car when he drove to the track. And then he had like his slick version, you know, a racing tire, which does not handle well. In not the rain, you, right? Um, that's what he had as his trailer tire, and then he'd get to the track, change all four tires, throw the boost at it, and just it was in like it. That car still to this day is probably gave me the drive to like I want to drag week something. Which that's why the whole forced induction argument is so prevalent these days because they're so versatile, and you can 
make such huge horsepower gains, but still remain still street drivable right. with just a couple clicks on a laptop. So it's, the the old people like my dad, you know, dad's famous line is the day he's got to program or tune his race car with a computer is the day he'll hang everything up like he's quitting. Which, which, in his defense, he's gotten a lot better because we we just poke at him all the time any t- any chance we get we give him a hard time about it and and the last time it was this year i kind of gave him a hard time about putting a hellcat in the dragster that yep. your brother's got and instead of wanting to hang it up he said i'll just be the sponsor driver you boys just work on it you guys can mess around with the I'll, laptop i'll wheel the shit out of yeah, it yeah i'll just drive it and so it, at least he's Kind of on board the except fact. He, I mean, except I mean the, the dude, fact. the dude's got Snapchat now. So, he does. I mean, and, we're and making TikTok. TikTok. He's and got TikTok. TikTok. <laughs> and he mind. and he loves Tony Reed. Let me tell you. <laughs> oh, yeah. Tony went on a rant about the freaking engineers that screwed up some bullshit on his on his head cart, yes. and I heard about that four times from your yep. dad. Oh, Hell, man. He, was, he was at my house tonight, sitting on the bed of his pickup truck. I was painting a fender on a truck for one of my dealerships. You know, he's old. You got the volume just as loud as, his phone, <laughs> as loud as it goes. And I was like, what are you doing? He's like, wow, watching this TikTok. Check this out. Like, you're 64 years old. So so has his TikTok for you page, has the algorithm brought him to the thirst trap big titty <laughs> Oh, oh he, And that was one of the videos. Oh, like, yeah. He's like, Look Check at out. this! Yeah, look at this! <laughs> Can you out. believe that? Like, <laughs> that'll do. It's it's twenty twenty two, pops. Uh, they like they let kids go to school looking yeah. like that. <laughs> Don't let Deb to see it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I didn't even ask him how he got TikTok because I know he's not your smart brother. To, no. So your brother bought him an iPhone for the express purpose of FaceTime and his grandkids. Right. Totally wholesome. You know. 100% straight up, <laughs> no big deal like this, 1,000% great. But your brother downloaded Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, and TikTok all before he gave him the phone. And, and that was the mistake. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> and, and I, you boys I, heard of the Big Bank <laughs> Challenge? <laughs> <laughs> At least he's not making TikToks exactly. yet. Exactly. Oh, that would be the best. That would though. be the day, though. So, with his profession, he's a diesel mechanic by trade. He could make, you know, some quality Snapchats or some quality TikToks. He, he, he could be one of the guys like you talked about making, you know, a tool video on TikTok or how to use a certain tool. The, we call him the mad scientist, or at least I do, because of. Every time I've ever been, you know, since I was old enough to remember, 14, 15 years old, working on stuff with him, it's always like, Dad, teach me. I want to learn. I want to learn, you know, why does it do this or how do you make so much horsepower out of little, you know, this or that. And Sam and Dozer laugh. They always say it's the Winston Ash. Yeah, he's yeah, sprinkled a little. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Them, um, that, that Winston Ash seats them rings real nice. But, yeah. but he just like, I don't know, his ways, it, like you fix something and he's like, well, did you see that? Like, well, yeah, I watch you, but you tell me why. And he's like, I don't know. It just works. Like it just works. I mean, the man could build a 727 transmission blindfolded. Yeah. It's, he's very talented. So shout out to Dean. Yeah, yeah. mean Dean. We'll we'll download uh, Spotify. Nick well, and I mean, uh, yeah. <laughs> he'll, he'll be our number one. I think fan. we've maybe talked about him in every single episode. Honestly, yeah, I think so. He 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 should be a guest host. We should take this podcast uh, on the road to his to, house. To his ha- to, well, we need to go to Rick's shed. Yes, because last year you were loaded up for London in the stacker, and I sat on the tailgate of the stacker for two hours, and I listened to your uncle Rick. Just talk about old car stories, and this guy bought this car and then sold it to this guy. And when you were talking about the Aspen, it brought yeah. that whole that whole conversation back. Just how back in the day, like, they kept the title in the glove box, and it was just like, "I'll trade you." Yeah, I'll, and, and, I'll, just, and just you, you beat just, me at this drag race, like I'll, I'll trade it today, like you know. Yeah, and, dad. Dad talks about all the time that grandma, grandpa had a, I think it was a wagon. I don't know what it was, sixty seven or eight. Belvedere wagon or Fury or something 
383 four speed. Dad said he won every single drag race, street race they ever entered um, in it. And then they broke a lifter or push rod or something. And Grandpa's like, Dad did, like, they limped at home. Him and Rick limped at home. And Grandpa's like, Well, what was wrong with it? Like, I don't know. It rained fine last night when we parked it. <laughs> and, you know, them two are out street racing. Like, like you said, I could listen to their stories for, you know, ever. Yeah, we need to talk. <clears throat> I've got a uh, business a business partner or somebody we do a lot of business with, he's got a 69 Fairlane Cobra jet. Okay. And it's got a 428 in it. And he talks about street racing all the time because <clears throat> I don't know if they didn't have drag strips around here or what. I know they had assumption, but you know, they, they did a lot of it, drag it, racing at the Beecher big... city T. I know there's a laundromat there. It used to be. And he said, I mean, he rarely lost. That's what, Tape a hundred dollar yeah. bill to the oh, dashboard. Yeah. And I got Jump it. a coke can. <laughs> yeah, but he said that the guy that dominated had an old farm truck, and you know, <clears throat> they would uh, they would show up and it just sounded mean. They had a big walk Chevy in this Chevy farm truck, and they just whooped everybody. Yep. So I wonder how much how much of the stories are embellished a lot. Oh, surely all of them. I hopefully. <laughs> I mean, like, and so. I guess what gets me is the 426 Hemi in my GTX. Now, granted, it wasn't running great. It was nutless. It but was not your brother's anything. your brother's minivan would outrun that yeah. fucking car. Every old man would talk about their 426 Hemi, baddest piece, you know, in the county, and I was not impressed with your GTX. So I, I'm hoping your old man can wake it up a little bit, but the, I mean. This may be the millennial in me, but you can't beat modern technology. No. Oh, new no. horsepower, you know, going way back to, you know, how we veered off to our conversation about new horsepower, but you can't beat it anymore. You see, you know, street, go, you know, a lot of street guys who build these muscle cars to bar hop or cruise or do burnouts in, um, LS swapping, you know, coyote swapping, five seven six one six four hemi swapping. It's definitely the way to go you know in the drag racing world i see a lot of dragsters nowadays running 430s or 450s with ls motors in them and hell there's one guy um can't think of his name runs at coles county often runs like 450 off the throttle stop and he said this 5.3 ls motor has 250 some thousand miles on it he's got a decent set of heads and he sprays the piss out of it with nitrous like that's it well, I mean, you know, the the old monster small block Chevy was a 350 four-bolt main. And, you know, you talk about, you know, splayed bolts in the main caps and stuff and cross-bolted mains. Like, that's high-end race car shit. Yeah. Right. I mean, aftermarket blocks, custom billet stuff. That's factory on a lot of... Yeah, I mean, roller, roller cam. Right. Yeah, a, you know, I know uh, Nate, our buddy that rebuilds engines, he got out of drag racing 15 years ago. And somebody brought him an LS motor to build, one of Sam's coworkers to build, and I think maybe do a stroker kit and stuff. And he like calls me, he's like, dude, this has six bolt mains. They're cross bolted. And he's like, it's got a roller cam. He's like, this is NASCAR. Yeah. I was like, yeah. <laughs> Why do you think everybody uses them? He's like, and they put them, they go a 250,000 miles in a half ton pickup truck. Yeah. I got a buddy that's got a LS out of a pickup truck. I think it had like no lie, probably three hundred and like fourteen thousand miles on it. Old rusty beat up truck. He put a sixty six millimeter turbo on it. Are we talking about Joe? No. Oh. Well, he's got one of them, but um, and he beats on it like street drives it, bar hops it, drag races it every once in a while on a Friday night. Well, Josh Stork has the 4A off of your garage floor dozer, yeah. and he put a big charger on it, and he's giving me a run for my money on the burnout champion. Like it, he, he beats on that one. Speaking of burnouts, I have got to have my car done for T-Town Cruise this year because Absolutely. my five-year-old son, I am the biggest disappointment <laughs> failure father ever because we have to watch people do burnouts instead of doing burnouts. Well, why can't we do burnouts? Take take Cohen so, with you. So the burnout car is not ready yet. You never have the burnout car ready. 
You are a failure yeah, no. as a parent. That that hurts. God me. forbid he has. Yeah, no. He's got clothes on his back and food in his He's, belly yeah. and a roof over his head. But doesn't matter. Yeah, not Sweet doing crossbow right. to kill deer. Yeah, with we, we, had he, a, he, uh, <laughs> we had a we had a my Jeep, which just has a three eight and thirty seven. Yo, can we do a burnout in the Jeep? It's hot. I wouldn't do it. Oh, you know it's, that's lame. And he brings up well, about two three weeks ago. I picked him up from the babysitter. And he gets in the car. He goes, "When are we going to have the burnout car done?" I'm like, oh, okay, I don't, I don't know. We're going to work on it, you know. So, so your your time frame is T Town Cruise. Yes, I have made a pact with my girlfriend that GTX will be ready to roll for the spring run, which is Kentucky Derby Day, which is my birthday weekend. How about so, them turbos and that dart. Yeah. That's after. <laughs> no, that's way after. I asked him his his project schedule. project schedule, and it's not. It didn't even make the list. Actually, that's that's disappointing. It's, it's at the end. So it's, it's, it's at the end. <laughs> it's at the end. It's it's somewhere on it's, the list. It's on the list. So the Jeep, putting the Hemi in the Jeep. Right. Putting the truck bed on my flatbed. Hemi in the GTX, and then it's. The turbos on the dart. Problem with the turbos on the dart is going to be like three burnouts in. I see rods like flying through the fenders. Okay, Dean. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to be like the it's Nick. A Allison, you got all the, them R. You got all them PSIs and <laughs> and no forged internals. You're going to be like the Nick Allison display at the A and A transmission. Like your transmission just showered no, no like, he's got I've sam got, put a blanket on his transmission because i have, I have all the high hemp parts for that i guess the, i forgot you bought all that and and the transmission right now has a blanket on it because i saw a picture of a that's real dra- life a, a barracuda drag car that had transmission parts go through the roof like through I, the trans tunnel then through the roof yep i was so, at a mopar event in columbus ohio and a guy had a 68 dart like let out of the trans brake and the flywheel, like tranny parts, flywheel, like came through the roof of the car, bust out the windshield. It was a hell of a deal. So then, anyway, well, I have what, a I what, have a custom ground cam, you guys. So that's custom. well. The issue is you're supposed to start your burnout in second gear, right? Absolutely, Mopars. Mo and, and your car doesn't have enough power to start in second gear. It does not. So you have to start in first gear to shift to second gear. But what brought it up is back when Sam built that car, he had flipped a razor with his then girlfriend in it and broke her arm. Snapped and, her arm in two pieces. Yeah, snapped her arm in half, essentially. And we were talking about the transmission exploded. And I was like, dude, I was like, if this transmission explodes and takes her leg off, like, like that's just I mean, strike not, that's not going to be yeah. good. You know yeah. what I mean? And like, I think you bought, once I brought that up, you bought that blanket the next day. The You're next like, day. I'm not going to have her in the hospital again. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, but no, it, uh, it's, it's, it's going to be good. Just I remember stay I'm, tuned. I'm, I'm, that blanket I'm on was a nightmare. Yeah. It's, it's I not have a drag fun. car and half my shit's cut and it's still a nightmare. So it, it, what it is, is in first gear, the drum that holds the first gear clutches spins at whatever gear, gear ratio <laughs> to the RPS. So they did the, I was at the A and A booth and did the calculation and it, at, you know, at 6,000 RPM, which is what the chips at, it's spinning like 26,000 RPM or some shit. And it's inside the transmission and it's just a pressed centered metal cast drum Pete, right that will just let go at that kind of rpm and i remember I remember standing in front of nick allison and uh your dad was trying to get me to buy a billet drum there and he was like this this boy needs a billet drum which i couldn't afford at the time and nick was like yeah like well, why i mean are you racing it and he's like nobody does a bunch of burnouts he's like well it shouldn't be a problem as long as you start at second gear and i was like i start in first gear and he's like Oh man, Dean! Why'd like, you like, let him, like why? throws his hands on the table, <laughs> yeah. like smacks Dean. his hands on the table, and he, and he goes, and so Nick was like, Dean, why are you letting him do that? And he goes, Sam, what's the first thing I said to you when you picked up that transmission? And I said, You said don't, and he interrupted me, <laughs> don't do first gear <laughs> burnouts, and that's that's how I make my living. Yeah, doing first yeah, gear burnouts. We actually have a whole podcast episode called Burnout King. It's in the queue. Yeah, it's in the queue where we talk about the 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 life and death and 
the pressure and the fame of being the guy who does the burnouts at the car show. The burnout guy. Yeah. yeah. It, any any time somebody says burnout, Sam yep. Sam's like that Kid Rock meme. You see where his arms are like <laughs> wailing out, like running to his car. You know when Sam's pulling out of a car show, a every little done. kid anywhere is like that. That's that guy with that black dart. Like th- th- that's the burnout my, car. That's yeah, that my, guy. My kids are like Sam. Sam the tool man about to do burnout. Like you know it's happening. Freaking Co- CDL on the line. Yeah. Let's Co- do it. Co- Cohen always says like Uncle Sam. He'll do burnouts. Uncle Sam. I'll, I'll go talk to Uncle Sam. My girlfriend's niece knows me for doing burnouts too. She says Sam burnout. Sam yeah. burnout. Well, that's, well, that's awesome. We wrapping this up. Yeah, let's, I'm tired of talking. Yeah, about <laughs> let's let's wrap this one up on that note. We've really gone off the rails here from our original goal. So, um, guys, thanks for listening. Kyle, thanks yeah. for being a guest anytime. tonight. I'll come back anytime. Um, so again, uh, we welcome your feedback and give us a drop us a line at ask short story long at gmail dot com, and uh, we'll see you next time. Have a great night. <laughs>